Welcome back to our last section, Chapter 10.4, Paradoxical Scenarios. We're following the Queensland Physics Syllabus, Unit 4, in particular the textbook by Walding, published by Oxford. Paradoxical Scenarios doesn't refer to your bedroom or your love life or anything like that. We're going to talk about problems in relativity and how we resolve those problems. Little joke there, another Back to the Future one. Um, Einstein published his theory of um, special relativity and then later his theory of general relativity but basically the scientific world at the time kind of wasn't really ready for it a bit like Michael J Fox playing uh, Johnny B Good and his parents uh, under the sea dance thing prom anyway it was kind of ahead of his time and it took a while, long while for uh, a lot of his um, work to be verified because it was so far ahead of its time all right, let's have a think about what's going on here. Imagine you've got a very, very powerful laser. You shine it on one side of the moon. And then you move that laser dot so it travel across the face of the moon. So we've got our moon here. So like imagine you could shine your laser dot on one side and then you moved it across until the laser dot shined on the other side of the moon. And you could move your hand or your, your instrument, sorry, in a fraction of a second to walk that laser across the moon. Uh, see the little joke I got there? So, if the moon has a diameter of 3,500 kilometers and you can move that dot across the face in one hundredth of a second because it's easy just to change the angle so slightly here on Earth, that uh, 3,500 and one one hundredth of a second means the dot would travel across the surface of the moon at 3.5 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. The speed of light is only 3 by 10 to the 8. How is it that we can be faster than the speed of light? So the question you've got to ask yourself is, is that possible? No, it's not. What we're doing in this case is shining a light beam at one side of the moon. And then as we move, it's a light beam coming from a, um, a light source that we have here. Oh, that's an eyeball, whatever. There's a light source that shines there and then it moves and the next light beam reaches out and moves there and the next light beam travels across the moon so we're actually sending individual think of it as individual light beams towards the moon and whilst this pattern may travel across the moon very very fast it's the light beams that are still traveling from the torch back here on earth assuming your torch is that good maybe your torch is as good as michael jackson's dancing all right, let's think about a different scenario. Two eyes are better than one for depths of perception. When you only have one eye, you actually find it really, really hard to perceive how close or how far away things are from you. That's depth of perception. So if two is good, two is better than one, would three be better than two? Why? How does this relate to space? And the answer is basically not really. You need two eyes to perceive depth because it's like in, inside your head you have two eyes and each one gets an image of what's in front of it because the light obviously travels from the object to your eye opposite to my original arrows there and the two eyes give you a slightly different angle of the view of the world in front of you and allow you to judge how far away that distance is and scientists do the same thing with space we might take um, readings of where an object is in the sky at different times throughout the year which is different orbits of earth and hence that will give us an idea of how far away it is because there's slightly different angles. A third position is great because it improves our, our error, our accuracy. However, it don't, it's not really needed. And that's why we really only have two eyes in our head and there's no evolutionary advantage to evolve a third eye, for example. So today, what are we doing? We're not gonna be talking about the Millennium Falcon the whole time. But anyway, we're going to look at some paradoxes. Famous ones like the Twins Paradox and the Ladder in the Barn Paradox and how that starts to relate to time travel. We will explain why objects do not travel faster than the speed of light and we will resolve these paradoxes so you can understand why these paradoxes are actually possible. The first paradox we're going to look at is the Twin Paradox. And this is the one where a pair of twins start at age 25 one travels off into space, whatever the age they start at, doesn't really matter. And we've got a few little variables. We've got 
the relativistic time and the velocity that's going to, that we're going to travel. I had a little um, Obi Wan Kenobi joke on the side there. Um, astronaut meets his twin brother after travelling through space. The idea of this twin paradox is one twin, twin travels into space at a very large speed and returns after some period of time and has aged less than his identical twin, his or her identical twin, who stayed stationary on Earth. So we're going to look at why the one that travelled off into space aged less than the one on Earth. And that's two pictures of Obi-Wan Kenobi there. General relativity, you are a bold one. Now, what we've got to work out. Before we actually look at this twin paradox, let's do some revision. That's why I've got my little revision star in the top corner there. We're going to work out T, L0 and L. So my question is, what are those terms, what do those variables mean? That's the relativistic time, that's the proper length and the relativistic length. Think about what the equations are for those. We're going to look at the relativistic time first. So I ask you, what's the equation for time dilation? Do you remember it? Or are you just waiting for me to write it? Is that what you're going to say? Yeah, well done. Yeah, tuck your shirt in next time and smarten up. Here we have our equation that we just uh, outlined. Let's plug the variables in. We know that t naught, the proper time, is 30 years. We know that the velocity is 0.8 the speed of light. So when we plug those in like that, we end up, we put into our calculator, the relativistic time is 50 years. That's the time passing back on Earth. So if 30 years passes for the twin that's travelling, started off at 25 plus 30 years, that means they come back. 55 years old. The twin that stays on Earth started at 25 years old, added 50 years to their age, so they waited 50 years for the twin to come back, 75 years old. And that's the relativity thing that we were talking about. They've aged at different rates because the time has dilated on Earth because of the relativistic speed between the two reference frames, Earth and the rocket. So let's work out relativistic length next what do we know we know that the proper time is 30 years we saw before that um, time is your distance in light years divided by your speed in c as in a percentage of c so if we rearrange that one We've got a time, we've got a speed, we can work out the distance that the travelling twin travelled. This is the travelling twin, twin, so that will give us the relativistic length, L, not L0. So L represents the relativistic distance of the journey to the travelling twin in the rocket. That's the formula I just had there, rearranged and written slightly differently. The distance is L. T in this scenario, we're talking about the twin that's travelling, so that would be T naught or the proper time, and the velocity in C. 30 years passed at 0.8 the speed of light means they travelled 24 light years. So now, in order to work out proper length, we need our uh, equation that we had before. Remember that one? And here we have it over here. And we plug our numbers in. What do we know? The relativistic length was 24 light years. The velocity is still 0.8. Both parties agree on that one. But the proper length is 40 light years. So when you put that in your calculator, it comes out as 40 light years is the distance that the, the proper length or distance that that twin, traveling twin traveled. So let's get back to our twin paradox. We have their two twins, one stays on Earth, one travels off in a rocket. When they return, the one on the rocket has aged less than the one on Earth. But let's get back to our inertial reference frames and all motion is relative. The twin on Earth sees the rocket travel away and come back. But the twin on the rocket could just as easily see the Earth recede away from them 
and then come back towards them. So why isn't it that the one in the rocket ages more and the one staying on Earth ages less? If all frames are relative, just as you're sitting on the train watching the station pass you, the person on the station is watching the train pass them, why does one twin age more or less than the other one? And to answer this, we have to look at a few little scenarios to kind of frame our thinking. Here's a road, and when we walk down that road, so like we're hiking down this road, and we can see when trees are at 90 degrees to the road and when they're not. So in that scenario, they're 90 degrees to the road. Those trees are not 90 degree right angle to the road, whereas those ones are. Now let's look at two different roads, two different hikers on two different roads. That tree A is at 90 degrees to road one, but it is not 90 degrees to road two. Okay, and this is the idea of two different frames of reference. Tree B and C are 90 degrees, but if you're on road one, they're not 90 degrees like just then. Let's watch that little uh, animation again to make sure we've understood it. A is 90 degrees, B is 90 degrees to road one, but not to road two. The only trees that are 90 degrees to road two are tree C and B. They form a line 90 degrees to road two, but if you're on road one, they are not 90 degrees to you. You have a different frame of reference. Similarly, similarly we don't tend to agree on lengths. So there's a 90 degree angle, and this little orange distance here might be um, one kilometer, for example, but you can see it's not the same distance on the other road. That might be one kilometre, but it's not one kilometre on that road there. Okay. So the red distance and the orange distance, road one says, yeah, they're one kilometre each, but road two says, no, it's not the same. That purple distance there might be a, a set distance, but you can see the blue distance is not the same when measured at 90 degrees to them. And I want you to kind of get the idea from looking at these little animations that it depends on which road you're on as to whether that distance is one kilometre or more than one kilometre. For example, on road two right now, that could be one kilometre, but it's not one kilometre on road one that they're actually travelling. And that kind of gives you an idea of how this twin paradox starts to get resolved. Let's look at another scenario here. We've got Emmy and Albert both head off for a hike. They both go from A to B but Albert goes via C. Now if we assume that Albert is like the twin traveling off into the distance and turning around on his rocket and coming back to home, Albert will age less than Emmy because they took off in the rocket and traveled at the high speeds, but they both reached B, which is effectively back on earth at some time in the future and both got there at the same time. What's different about their journeys? Obviously you can see that Albert went longer but the crucial difference between these two journeys is that at point C here, Albert changed his velocity. We, even if he didn't change the speed that he was walking at, he changed his velocity because he changed direction that he was traveling. And that implies that he underwent an acceleration in his velocity. Even if his speed was a constant pace the whole way through that hike, he changed, he accelerated his velocity in a different direction and that's the crucial part to explain how this um, paradox gets resolved. I highly encourage you to watch Star Wars with the Millennium, uh, with the, the crew there of the Millennium Falcon. Totally awesome. So, the reason Albert's trip was different was he changed velocity at point C. So, hence there was some acceleration that he underwent at point C. This change in velocity or this acceleration will help us resolve this twin paradox. And you can start to think, which is the twin that's going to change their velocity throughout this uh, endeavor? It must be the twin on the rocket that will accelerate away from Earth, hence they're changing velocity as they accelerate their rocket up to a, their speed. And then at some point they will turn around, turn the rocket around and head back towards Earth and come back out, come back towards Earth. Now, they could accelerate straight out from Earth in a straight line, slow down, turn around, and come, then accelerate back towards Earth in a line straight out and back. Or they could head off from Earth, 
and head off in a really big arc around and come back around like that. That's basically an example of circular motion and there is always a change in velocity in circular motion, even if the speed remains constant. And that's our, our crucial part to resolve this paradox. The twin on Earth undergoes uniform motion, the twin on the rocket undergoes acceleration, and that's how we know they are the one that is moving and hence undergoing these high speeds. It's not Earth moving away from them, it's them moving away from Earth. So let's summarize that. The twin on the Earth undergoes uniform motion because they stay there on Earth. The, twin on, the rocket twin undergoes acceleration. They must change their velocity at the beginning and end of the trip and also when turning around in space. So they must be the one that is moving, hence they must be the one that has the, um, the proper time and the Earth has the dilated time. Incidentally, with this point that I said at the start here, although the Earth is moving, we often consider it to be an inertial reference frame stationary in space, even though it's actually not. So, Earth twin measures the proper length, rocket twin measures the contracted or shortened length, relativistic length. Both twins agree that there's a relative velocity because we always agree on the velocity between the two frames. The rocket twin must measure a shorter time to cover that, that um, shorter length that they're traveling. Thus, returns to Earth having aged less than the Earth twin. And how do we know this? Because we proved it in the early 70s, got really, really precise clocks, put them in really, really fast jets, and told them to fly up, at, you know, up in the atmosphere really, really high, really, really fast for a long time. And they confirmed when the two clocks were synchronized before this, one went up into the airplane and traveled at a large speed for a long time, came back to Earth and looked at the two clocks and they did not show the same time. The one that underwent the acceleration or the high speeds in the plane showed um, a slower time and less time had passed for that clock than the one here on Earth. And these days we prove the same thing with GPS satellites that we'll talk about later in this um, presentation. So, all depends on your frame of reference. Just have a look at this um, animation here. It's almost like if we change our frame of reference from one ship to another, the actual lengths and times and so on start to change. I do encourage you to watch this a few times just to get all the intricacies of what's going on there before you move on. So that brings us back to this scenario here. We're on two different paths, the traveling twin and the stationary twin back on Earth, and hence they're not measuring things the same way. This is why both observers appear to the other one to be traveling at a different time. Think about um, the journey a little bit like this. It's almost like this traveling twin has this point where they change their velocity and that changes how the, the simultaneity starts to match up between the two frames of reference, between the traveling one and the stationary one. All right, before I look at this uh, pole and barn paradox, just have a look at the uh, little challenge down the bottom here, infinite speed. Imagine that the speed of light was infinite. What would happen about all of these ideas that we've been discussing? If you think about it, it was Maxwell who created his equations where basically he worked out that the speed of light had to be 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. Why? Because it was the energy that was distributing between the magnetic and the electrical field to make the electromagnetic wave and make it stable. If the velocity of this, this wave was slower, it would be unstable and energy would be lost and it would start to collapse. If the um, speed was higher, you would need an infinite amount of energy to maintain that wave. At the speed of light, um, everything worked out to be perfect and balance each other. And that's how we started to work out what the speed of light was. Um, none of the equations we've used Will make any sort of sense if the speed of light changes um, because they're all worked out on a constant speed of light in all frames of reference and i mean i guess if you think about it think about our time dilation this bloke here okay if our uh, if the speed of light for example is infinite this term down here becomes infinity 
So what we effectively have is t naught over 1 minus 0, or the square root of 1 minus 0. And what does that end up meaning? Now we know clearly that that's not true because we've done experiments back in 1971 that show that that's not true. So hence it wouldn't work. None of these equations would work and none of this relativity would work if the speed of light changed because it's all worked out on a constant speed of light. Okay, let's have a look at the pole and barn paradox. This paradox is, can you fit a 20 meter pole inside a barn that is 10 meters long? We have a, um, think of an old barn of a certain size, and that is 10 meters wide or 10 meters long. We have a, a, bowl, a pole or a ladder, for example, like this one here, let's call it a ladder. And that's 20 meters long. Will that fit inside the barn? Obviously in the Newtonian world, no it won't. But if we move that pole fast enough, its length will start to contract. If it moves fast enough, it will end up being less than this magic 10 meters wide and hence it should fit in the barn. But the paradox here comes in when, just like the twin paradox, if this um, ladder moves very, very fast, What's to say the ladder is not stationary and it is the barn moving really fast. And hence, as the barn moves fast towards the ladder, the barn, st the barn starts to contract and becomes less than 10 metres. How does that work in that scenario? Here's another way of looking at it. 10 metre barn, 20 metre pole, obviously they wouldn't fit. But if we're travelling, for example, at 0.9 the speed of light, our pole will contract to about 8.73 meters. Will an 8 meter, 8.7 meter pole fit inside a 20 meter barn? Yes, it will. But if we're looking from the um, pole's point of view, the barn is coming at you at 90% the speed of light. Its length contracts to 4.37 meters. Will the pole fit inside the barn? A 20 meter pole obviously won't fit inside a 4.3 meter barn. So. How do we resolve this paradox? Because we can make this work. And the resolution lies back in simultaneity. So, this picture in the middle here, uh, change my colour, this one here, is just the classic Newtonian version. You've got your barn and your ladder or your pole or whatever. It won't fit because the, the pole's too big to fit inside the barn. If we look over on the left hand side here, in this scenario, we have the barn that is stationary. See the barn stationary throughout all these images and it's the ladder that's moving in. Because it's the ladder that's in motion, its length is contracted. It can fit inside the barn and you can close both doors at the same time and fit inside the barn before you quickly open the doors again and let it back out the other side. And that was the idea of the 10 meter barn and the eight meter ladder, it would fit inside so if you close the doors at just the right time, you would enclose your shed and the ladder would fit inside it because its length is contracted. Now, let's look at a different scenario where over the side here, where it is the ladder that's stationary and the barn is moving towards it at 90% the speed of light. This works because of the idea of simultaneity. As the ladder, as the barn moves past the ladder, we can close one door and then open it back up again. And then the ladder keeps moving, the barn, sorry, keeps moving past the ladder. And then we can close the other door and then open it back up again. And the ladder keeps moving. This works because the two events don't happen at the same time. If you're sitting on that ladder, you would still perceive, or that pole, you would still perceive your length as being 20 meters. And you would see perceive the barn as being contracted from 10 meters down to like four meters, whatever I said before, two meters. But the events of the two doors opening and closing are not happening at the same time from your point of view. It's much like a couple of uh, videos ago, we spoke about an example about a train passing a um, hill and there was a, a train carriage and a light in the middle and it sent out a light beam either way and the doors opened when the light beam reached it. And if you're on the train, you see them open at the same time. 
if you're standing on the bank, these two events don't happen at the same time because the front door is moving away from the light beam, the rear door is moving up towards. So if you're standing on the bank, you see this door open first, this door open second. And that's kind of the scenario that's going on here. If you're on that ladder moving towards the, and the, and the shed's moving towards you, you would see the first door close and reopen, and then the second door close and reopen. They are not simultaneous events. Right, we do um, look at um, space time diagrams developed back in the early 1900s to try and um, visualize some of these Lorenz transformations and how relativity actually works. And it's kind of a bit like this scenario here. Think of these black axes as sort of um, normal at rest time, and the blue ones are your sort of relativistic measurements. And it's because the angles are different, the measurements are different. So a moving observer has non-perpendicular axes. And we sort of draw it that way to show how this goes on. And event A is given different coordinates depending on which axes you use. This point here on the x-axis is different from um, the x prime axis because it's a different length. Any line parallel to the x-axis, if I draw it in a different colour, so if I draw a line here, that will be exactly this length on the x-axis, but on our altered axis, you can see it's, even though it's all still should line up, the length of this bit in the middle here is longer. And likewise, if you draw a line here, on this um, time axis, what do we see in that? We see that you have this time period, this time period here, and this altered sort of dilated time period on this axis here, because that's physically along the line, that last arrow I drew. Okay, and that's what that tells us. Another way to think about this, think about um, some lady beetles that are all born at the same time, hence they're all uh, twins. Here's our time axis running up here, and hence they are all aging through time at the same rate. But if you're traveling um, relativistically very fast, and you're on a spaceship coming through, you catch one ladybug, and then you travel through this x-axis so your time axis is a little bit different until you reach this ladybug and capture him you capture two ladybugs at different points in time and hence you have two twins that are now different ages no little point down the side there but that's a bit of an extension from the course here's some other ways of looking at our paradoxes we have two events where we have one axis here and our relativistic axis here where things are different and whereas this clock may read the same time in these two axes in this x-axis it reads a different time because time has passed between this clock here and this clock here likewise with the barn and the pole paradox if this axis and this one represents the barn's point of view the pole has contracted and hence it fits, you can see that red line, it fits inside the barn. However, these altered axes are a relativistic one where the, the, the pole stays its length but it sees the barn contract. As that pole moves through its time axis, the time it hits the rear door is here and hence the rear door closes and opens. And the time that it reaches the front door is here and hence that's the point in time where the front door the front door of the barn closes and opens again and it's like on this axis that's the point and that's the point in time where the front of the pole hits the back of the barn and the door can close and then open again and let it out and this point in time which is later the back of the pole has reached the front of the barn 
and its door can close and open again. That's kind of what I mean about the simultaneity of it. These two events are not happening at the same time for the pole, whereas for the barn, they are happening simultaneously. Okay, here's a question here, and never mind my smart uh, comment at the front there. Have a go at this question. Um, page 291 of our text has some stuff about global positioning satellites. If you don't have the text handy, just look it up online. It gives time figures for proper time and dilated time of a global uh, positioning satellite, a GPS satellite. So what you need to think about is how do we know the satellite's measuring proper time? Because we know it's in motion with respect to the Earth. So what you want to do is can you verify the accuracy of these measurements? Look up what is the proper time and dilated time for a GPS satellite. Plug it into our equation and see if you can verify it. Our GPS satellites these days have an accuracy of about 15 metres. So I've got to ask yourself, why? Why is it 15 metres? Why isn't it more or less or whatever? We can be more accurate with more satellites, but each satellite only has an accuracy of about 15 metres. Think about what is the speed of light, because that is the velocity that that light is travelling in at. And when it hits the Earth, there is a certain uh, time that's going to um, travel, and that will give us a displacement that it's going to be, which should be the 15 metres. There's some more work about the um, Twins Paradox, the theory of relativity, and some of that uh, satellite stuff I was talking about. And we've got some uh, understanding questions. There's our Millennium Falcon that's come back again. Yes, it's an awesome ship. It's the only uh, ship to do the Kessel Run in under 12 parsecs. Uh, galaxies are moving away from each other faster than the speed of light. So physicists say this doesn't violate the, the idea that the speed of light is the maximum speed limit. So how does this happen? That's true because the actual fabric of the universe is expanding. Not only are two galaxies moving away from each other at great speeds, but the, the physical space between them is also stretching and expanding at the same time whilst they move away from each other. So even if they didn't move, they would have this separation distance here, but then that would then increase because the actual space itself is increasing. Hence, they appear to move away from each other faster than the speed of light, simply because space itself is expanding. It's almost like you could think of it simply as the length of a metre is getting bigger, so to speak. I should add that we don't actually really see that here in our lives. It's only on large distances and relativistic speeds. Think about your research investigation. There is that uh, Science as a Human Endeavour section to help you do that. Um, some of this stuff about GPS technology is um, quite topical and, and quite um, quite good to get some, some really good meaty sort of investigations out of. Um, point this bit out here. Originally, the US Department of Defence made the GPS satellite system and they made the signals deliberately fuzzy, so the accuracy was 100 metres. Why did they do that? They spent the money to develop this whole satellite system to navigate across the ground easily. It was a military thing, and they wanted the military advantage, and so they kept it for a while. And for the most part, people were happy with that. Not happy, but they lived with it, until eventually the US Department of Defence said, you know what, we'll switch off this, um, this inaccuracy that we built into the system, and we get much, much better accuracy these days. But I guess it is a defence system. If they wanted to turn it back on and increase the inaccuracy, they could do it at any time they like. Welcome, World War Three. So, a few questions there. Which of the following is false? Three satellites are required. Gravity is also affected. Also affects the time signal because the speed of light is affected by gravity or space-time is warped by a gravitational field, which will appear to affect the speed of light bit like our time and relativistic time. Um, there's heaps of uh, GPS satellites that you can usually see at any one time. Are they banned for military use? No, that was made for the military originally, as I just said. There's a nice article from the ABC News I want you to go and check out, which uh, proves some of Einstein's work. Nice little video, I suggest you go and check out. I know it is another 16 minutes of your life, but don't worry, it'll pay you dividends to watch that. 
I do like this uh, summary on this um, this particular website. Go and check it out. You can click on these little things and it gives you a sort of a nice summary of relativity. You can see the flowchart here where we start with relativity. We look at the Lorentz transformation, length contraction, time dilation, relativistic mass, mass energy equivalence, and so on. And there's a few other little um, extra points in there just to round out your knowledge on this topic. All right, we spoke about the twins paradox. We know that one twin in the rocket is moving because they have that acceleration change. We spoke about the ladder in the barn paradox. It's a simultaneity event. The events are not happening simultaneously to the two different reference frames. And time travel is built into all this stuff. And we should be happy with our understanding of that one, of how we resolve these paradoxes. All right. Just like the Millennium Falcon there when it, uh, with that explosion behind it. Head on to uh, check your learning and have a look at the um, end of chapter review.